time. Father, as we transition now to the study of the word, we pray for your Holy Spirit to guide and lead us. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity. Thank you for affording us the uh, opportunity, even while some are in quarantine or some are uh, merely trying to uh, stay away from the uh, uh, sickness floating about or uh, just can't go into the house of God because of the different regulations and stipulations that are placed upon houses of worship. Father, we pray that you would bless us anyhow. We also pray, Father, in that regard, that you would uh, soon uh, lift these things, that we might be able to join back together safely and to be warmed by one another's uh, company and fellowship, that we might edify one another and encourage one another, provoking one another to love and good works. Father, help us in these uncertain times. It's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So if you have your Bible, I'm going to invite you to <clears throat> turn your Bibles to the book of Ezekiel. All right, so go with me in your Bibles to the book of Ezekiel, and we're going to chapter 14. Now, today we're talking about the remnant, and uh, the title of the sermon today, or the study today, is The Remnant, Noah, Daniel, and Job. And we're going to look at these three men and how these three men uh, typify the remnant. And why particularly these three men typify the remnant? Uh, these are the three men that the Lord uses to identify the remnant at the end of the world. And in this particular order, Noah, Daniel, and Job. And as we read the word of God, we're going to see that Noah, Daniel, and Job, that particular order is very important. Uh, and I'll make comment on that in just a moment. So let's turn to Ezekiel chapter 14, the 14th chapter of Ezekiel. Uh, run with me there, and we're going to start in verse 12. So Ezekiel 14, and we're looking in the 12th verse. So the Bible says, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, when the land sinneth against me by trespassing grievously, then will I stretch out mine hand upon it, and will break the staff of bread thereof, and will send famine upon it, and will cut off man and beast from it. Though these three men, Noah, Daniel and Job were in it, they should deliver but their own souls by their righteousness, saith the Lord God. If I cause noise and beasts to pass through the land, and they spoil it, so that it be desolate, that no man may, may, may pass through because of the beasts, though these three men were in it, as I live, saith the Lord God, they shall deliver neither sons nor daughters. They shall only be delivered, but the land shall be desolate. Or if I bring a sword upon the land and say, sword, go through the land so that I cut off man and beast from it. Though these three men were in it as I live, saith the Lord God, they shall deliver neither sons nor daughters, but they shall only be delivered themselves. Or if I send a pestilence into the land and pour out my fury upon it in blood to cut off from it man and beast. Though Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it as I live, saith the Lord God, they shall deliver neither sons nor daughters, they shall but deliver their own souls by their righteousness. For thus saith the Lord God, how much more when I send my four sore judgments upon Jerusalem, the sword, the famine, the noisome beast, and the pestilence to cut off from it man and beast. Yet behold, there shall be left a remnant that shall be brought forth both sons and daughters Behold, they shall come forth unto you, and ye shall see their way and their doings, and ye shall be comforted concerning the evil that I have brought upon Jerusalem, even concerning all that I have brought upon it. And so I want you to notice here that what the Lord does as he goes through the four sword judgments, uh, he starts off with the famine, then the noise and beast, then he goes through the uh, sword and the pestilence uh, numerous times. And we'll just look at verse 19 and 20 for an example, or verse 20 for example, where it says, though Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, um, they shall, they, as I live, saith the Lord God, they shall deliver neither son nor daughter, but they shall deliver their own souls by their righteousness. God mentions this particular point over and over again through the chapter of Ezekiel. Now, the order is important. And we're going to deal with that order uh, towards the end of our study today. But I want you to, to kind of just kind of think about these things, especially as we're reading the Bible and you read and you see certain names there. 
Um, if you're familiar enough with the scriptures, you'll, as you're reading, you might say, well, why is it Noah, Daniel, and then Job? Shouldn't it be Noah, Job, and then Daniel? Isn't that how the characters of scripture or the men of scripture uh, actually were identified through Genesis and onward uh, as they lived upon the earth? Wouldn't Noah be first, then Job, then Daniel? You know, why is the order changed? Uh, these are the kind of things that the student wants to look at when they're studying the Bible. They want to notice those type of things, notice those type of uh, apparent maybe discrepancies or not a discrepancy necessarily, but maybe just certain changes because God is trying to emphasize something uh, through those things. Uh, also, you'll notice that there are three men that are represented, Noah, Daniel, and Job. And of course, uh, we've studied enough together uh, to recognize that when the Bible speaks of things in threes, either it's going to represent the uh, Father, the Son of the Holy Spirit, it's going to represent the first, the second, the third angel, or it's going to represent the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. And in this particular instance, we know it's not Father, Son, Holy Spirit, or dragon, beast, false prophet. These are righteous men, uh, and God is not identifying himself through man. So it's not the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and it's definitely not the evil characters of dragon, beast, false prophets. So that leaves us with the first, the second, and the third angel. And when we begin to see these things in that light, then you'll begin to understand why Noah is first, and then why Daniel is second, and why Job is third. And we'll get into that together uh, soon enough. Uh, one thing I want you to notice as well in Ezekiel chapter 14, from verse 21 to 22, after going through the four judgments, after mentioning Noah, Daniel, and Job numerous times, so showing that only they would be left, only they would be delivered by their own righteousness, then it enters into the principle of the remnant. And it shows that even though these four sore judgments come into the land in verse 21, to cut off man and beast from it, yet God would leave a remnant in verse 22. And Job, or Noah, Daniel, and Job, excuse me, they represent the remnant at the end of the world. And so we wanna talk about the remnant. The bulk of our study is going to be about the remnant and characteristics of the remnant and how we will know whether we're a part of the remnant or whether we'll be a part of the remnant. And so I want to begin our study on the remnant in Ezekiel 26, or excuse me, Exodus 26. So flip over to the second book of the Bible, uh, Exodus 26, we're gonna look in verse 12. So we want to identify what the word remnant means. So rather than go to a dictionary and look it up in the dictionary, we wanna just simply identify from scripture what remnant means, all right? Letting the Bible interpret itself. So we're in the book of Exodus 26. We're in Exodus 26 and we're looking together in verse 12. Exodus 26 and verse 12. We are in the 26th chapter of Exodus, the 12th verse, and the Bible says this, and the remnant that remaineth of the curtains of the tent, the half curtain that remaineth shall hang over the backside of the tabernacle. So notice the Bible talks about the remnant that remaineth, okay? So a remnant is that which remains, all right? That which is left over. Look at in your Bible to 2 Kings. So go to 2 Kings with me. So we're in 2 Kings. We, we just read Exodus 26 and verse 12, identifying that the remnant represents that which remains. Now we're going to 2 Kings chapter 19. So 2 Kings 19, we're going to look together in verse 4. 2 Kings 19 verse 4, and then we're going to skip down to verse uh, 30. So in 2 Kings 19 and verse 4, still talking about the remnant, still trying to identify what a remnant means, the Bible says in verse 4 of 2 Kings 19, it may be the Lord thy God will hear all the words of Rabshakeh, whom the king of Assyria, his master, hath sent to reproach the living God, and will reprove the words which the Lord thy God hath heard. Wherefore, lift up thy prayer for the remnant that are left. And then look at verse 30. And the remnant that is escaped of the house of Judah shall yet again take root downward and bear fruit upward. For out of Jerusalem shall go forth a remnant, and they that escape out of Mount Zion, 
the zeal of the Lord of hosts shall do this. So in the Bible now, we're identifying that the remnant not only is that which remains according to Exodus 26, but the Bible says in verse 4 of 2 Kings chapter 19, the ending part of verse 4, the remnant are those that are left. And then in verse 30, the remnant are those that are escaped. And then in verse 31, the remnant are they uh, 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 and escape out of Zion. So those that remain, those that are left, those that escape. And of course, this gives us an idea that if you are, if you remain, if you're left, if you're escaping, you have to go through something in order to be determined as the remnant. Right. Nobody is just recognized as remnant unless they have first gone through an experience and they remain. They go through a certain experience and they're the ones that are left. They go through a certain experience and they're the ones that escape. This is what the Bible identifies as the remnant. All right. So let's begin to run through the scriptures a little bit more and go through some deeper ideas as far as the remnant are concerned. So I want you to turn with me now to Joel. So go to Joel chapter two. All right, so we're going to Joel, the second chapter, and we're going to look in verse 32. Joel chapter two, and we're looking in verse 32, the 32nd verse of the second chapter of Joel. So in Joel two and 32, the Bible says it this way. It says, it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord hath said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. So when we were talking about a remnant, those that remain, those that are left, those that are escaped, here the Bible is talking about how God is going to deliver his people in Jerusalem, and it identifies the remnant. Now here's the first characteristic we want to write down regarding the remnant. We've identified what a remnant means, but now let's, let's look at some of the characteristics of the remnant. Number one, it says at the end of Joel chapter two, verse 32, it says, in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. Right? So we wanna understand that the remnant are called and not just called. Of course, we know that Matthew 22 and verse 14 tells us that many are called, but few are chosen and the few would be the remnant. So the remnant are both called and chosen. We know they're the ones that escape a certain experience. We know they're the ones that are left. They're the ones that remain after going through a particular uh, 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 experience in Earth's history. But the Bible also identifies them now as far as their characteristics are concerned. And it says that they are the ones who are called and therefore they are also chosen. Many called but few are chosen. The remnant are both called and chosen. All right, so let's look at characteristic number two. We're going to Isaiah 46. Isaiah the 46th chapter. And we're going to just simply look at verse three. So Isaiah chapter 46 and verse three. This is characteristic number two. So Isaiah 46, and we're looking at the third verse, 46th chapter of the book of Isaiah, verse three. And I'm repeating myself uh, as I normally do, uh, just because I'm, I'm, I'm hoping at least uh, that some are out there maybe, maybe taking their notes. So I don't wanna go too fast. So Isaiah 46 and the third verse, the Bible says it this way. It says, hearken unto me, O house of Jacob and all the remnant of the house of Israel, which, are born by me from the belly, which are carried from the womb. All right, so the word born there is the word, uh, not the word born like is in birth, but born as in carried, all right? The word, the uh, letter E is at the end. So born by me from the belly and carried by me from the womb. Or So when the Bible is referring to the remnant here, God says that he carries them from the belly he, or he bears them from the belly, he carries them from the womb. In other words, the remnant are carried by the Lord after their birth. Interesting. The Bible identified the remnant as called and chosen. The second characteristic the Bible shows that the Lord carries the remnant after their birth. All 
All right. So what is this birth that we're talking about? And this will lead us into the third characteristic. So the remnant are called and chosen. The remnant are carried by the Lord after their birth. But what birth are we referring to? All right. Flip with me to uh, the book of Romans. So we're going to Romans chapter nine. Romans chapter nine. And we're going to start in verse four. And I want to look at Romans nine, verse four. To I, I did the. No one is actually born, physically born, into being a, a, a the remnant. You know, we can't say, "Well, I was, you know, born a remnant. I was born this way or born that way." That's not what the Bible is referring to. The birth that God is referring to is spiritual. All right. So you're called and you're chosen if you're a part of the remnant. You also are carried by the Lord, sustained by God after your birth. Now, what birth is this? Romans 9, verse 4. Romans chapter 9, verse 4. We'll read to around maybe verse, verse 8 or so. It says, who are Israelites? And remember, the reason why, uh, well, let me explain to you. The reason why we're looking at this particular verse is, and and identifying who the Israelites are, because as we study the remnant through the Bible, it, God always refers to the remnant as coming from Israel or coming from, from Judah, coming from his people. All right, so this particular verse is very important. It says, who are Israelites? To whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises? Who are the fathers and of whom are concerning the flesh Christ came who is over all, God blessed forever, amen. Not as though the word of God had taken none effect, for they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. God does not, and we've talked about this in other presentations, God does not recognize birth lineage. Now, it doesn't matter if you are, if you can trace your lineage, you can do one of those, you know, those DNA tests and find out that you come from a certain tribe or certain location. God doesn't care about that at all. The Bible says it's not because you're the seed of Abraham that you are recognized as being a part of Israel. It's if you are a child of the promise, those are the ones counted for seed, all right? So it's not about physical birth. God doesn't care about that. So if the remnant are called and chosen, and if the remnant are carried by God after their birth, what birth then is the Lord referring to? What is this child of promise experience? Well, Jesus referred to this in some of the uh, most familiar areas of all the scripture in the book of John chapter three. So go there with me in John, the third chapter. We're not going to look at verse 16. That's probably the most well-known verse in the entire world. Everybody knows John 3, 16. I want to go to a few uh, verses before that. So we're looking in John chapter 3, and we're going to start in verse 3. So John 3, verse 3, and we're going to read to around verse 7. And this will identify for us the birth that the remnant have this is the experience the remnant go through. And once they have that experience, God will sustain them. God will carry them. All right. So notice what it says in John chapter three. And we're looking in verse three, John three and verse three. The Bible says it this way. Jesus answered and said unto them, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto thee, he must be born again. And so Christ identifies very clearly that unless a man, a woman, a child, unless a person is born again, they cannot enter into the kingdom of God. This born again experience, this conversion experience, this being born of God experience, this becoming a child of promise experience, this is what will determine whether we will be a part of the remnant or not. And I wanna make something clear, just because a person is born again, does not mean he will be a part of the remnant. 
even though this is a characteristic of the remnant, even though anyone who will be a part of God's remnant at the end of the world will have been born again, it doesn't mean that if you are born again, you'll be a part of the remnant. All right, that's important. Because the remember, the remnant, they're the ones that remain. They're the ones that are left. They're the ones that will go through an experience and be delivered. Okay, so they're the ones that remaineth after a certain experience will take place. And we'll look at that. Uh, what that is uh, shortly. So the third characteristic that we're talking about is how those that make up the remnant, uh, they're born again and they're sustained by the power of God. So let's look at characteristic number four. Now we're running to the book of Micah chapter seven. So let's turn there, Micah chapter seven and verse 18. Micah chapter seven and verse 18. Micah, the book of Micah in the Old Testament, the seventh chapter and the 18th verse. Micah 7, verse 18. Notice what Bible says. It says in Micah 7, verse 18, who is a God like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? So notice what we're reading in Micah chapter 7, verse 18, about how God pardons iniquity and passes by transgression. This is what, this is an experience, the remnant panel, all right? So God passes by the, rim, the transgression of the remnant of his heritage. He retaineth not his anger forever because he delighteth in mercy. He will turn again. He will have compassion upon us. This is verse 19. He will subdue our iniquities and will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. Though, well, excuse me, thou wilt perform the truth to Jacob and the mercy to Abraham, which thou hast sworn unto our fathers from the days of old. So notice the Bible identifies the remnant here in Micah chapter seven. They go through an experience of not just being born again, not just being uh, sustained by the power of God, not just being called and chosen, but God passes by their iniquity. He, 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 he pardons their iniquity. He passes by the transgression of the remnant. And what does that mean? It says that he would delight in mercy. In verse 19 says that he will have compassion and subdue our iniquities and cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. In other words, the remnant not only have their sins forgiven, but conquered and cast away. So they're not just forgiven. They're ju just not just some judicial pardoning that some people think forgiveness is. No, the remnant not only are born again, not only are they sustained by the power of God, but if they are sustained by the power of God, God can keep them from falling. They do not sin. They overcome sin. Not only is their sins forgiven, but God subdues their iniquity. To subdue means to conquer, to, to hold firm and fast. God is the one that subdues the iniquity of the remnant in their life. And that's a beautiful thought. And the Bible finally says that he would cast their sins into the depths of the sea. And this, of course, will, would get us into the understanding that their sins would be blotted out, separated from the, the remnant and even God's thoughts forever. So what a wonderful experience the remnant have, all right? So the remnant not only have their sins forgiven, but conquered and cast away. They're called, they're chosen, they're carried by God after their birth. Their birth is a spiritual birth. And so when they're born again, they're sustained by the power of God and that power to sustain them, not only is the forgiveness of sin, but the conquering of their sins and God finally cast those sins away. So we are now looking at the fifth, the fifth point of what happens or the, not what happens, but the characteristic, excuse me, of the remnant. So let's go back to Micah. Go back to Micah chapter five. We're going back to Micah, the fifth chapter. Micah, the fifth chapter, and we're going to look in verse uh, five, Micah five, five. So you just turn backwards two chapters and we're going to Micah five and we're looking in verse five and we're gonna read down to verse seven. So the Bible says, and this man shall be the peace when the Assyrian shall come into our land and when he shall tread in our palaces, 
then shall we raise against him seven shepherds and eight principal men. Now you'll remember we, this was years ago now, literally, literally years ago, we, we did a study on Micah chapter five, what the seven shepherds and the eight principal men represent, how the seven shepherds are the seven pillars of the Advent faith and the eight principal men are the uh, eight doctors or the, the eight laws of health. And God is going to use the seven pillars of our faith and the eight laws of health to not only protect us against the Assyrian when he comes within our land, uh, the Assyrian, of course, is the king of the north. So this time period here where God is going to protect his people is going to be during the Sunday law crisis, during what we call the little time of trouble. And God is going to use our faith, our doctrines, that which makes us Seventh-day Adventists. He's going to use that which we believe and uphold and teach to sustain us and to protect us. And notice what the Bible says. Once again, I'm going to read verse five. It says, this man shall be the peace when the Assyrian shall come into our land. This man, of course, was referring to Christ. It says, and he shall tread, and when the he, the king of the north, the Assyrian, shall tread in our palaces, then shall we raise against him seven shepherds and eight principal men, and they shall waste the land of Assyria with the sword and the land of Nimrod and the entrances thereof. Thus shall he deliver us from the Assyrian when he cometh into our land and when he treadeth within our borders. God will deliver his people through those seven shepherds and eight principal men. And the Bible says in verse seven, and the remnant of Jacob, here's the remnant now, the remnant of Jacob shall be in the midst of many people as a dew from the Lord, as the showers upon the grass that tarrieth not for man, nor waiteth for the sons of men. So first the Bible identifies an experience. There's going to be the Assyrian coming within our land, coming within our borders. We won't get into all of that. We've studied that before. This is the Sunday law time period, first in America, then in the world. When the king of the north comes, when the Sunday law crisis comes, God is going to protect his people. How is he going to do it? He's going to raise up those seven shepherds, those seven pillars of our faith, the doctrines that make us who we are, and those eight principal men, those eight laws of health that the remnant will be keeping. And this is going to uh, uh, bring an end to the king of the north. This is the, the swelling of this loud cry, of the third angel that goes forth. And the Bible says, as a result, in verse 7, the remnant will be in the midst of many people as a dew from the Lord, as the showers upon the grass that tarrieth not for man, nor waiteth for the sons of men. Hmm. Sunday law crisis comes in, loud cry of the third angel uh, is going forth. Our doctrines are, have swollen, are, are swelling into a loud cry. There's power that's taking place. You have a people who are a people of health, a, a, a people of temperance, and God is going to use them to bring down the mighty Assyrian, the king of the north. And the Bible shows that those who do the work those who are going through that experience, the Bible says that remnant will be in the midst of many people as a dew from the Lord, showers upon the grass. What are these dew and showers? Well, we know, we've studied this enough, but let's turn to Joel chapter two. What are the dew and showers that God is going to uh, not only bring upon the remnant, but cause the remnant to be in the midst of the people? Look at Joel chapter two. Joel chapter two. So in Joel chapter two and verse 23, Joel chapter two and verse 23, notice what the Bible says. We're talking about the doing showers that's taking place here. Notice the, the, the uh, uh, two experiences, do and showers, right? So notice what the Bible says in Joel chapter two, verse 23. Bible says, be glad then ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately, that's the dew, and he will, come, he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. So the Bible is talking about the dew and the showers is referring to the early and the latter rain. The remnant will have the early and latter rain. They will have the experience of the early and the latter rain. And if we want to uh, just really identify what that is, I'll just jump down a few verses. Look at verse uh, 28. It says, it will come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. 
and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions, and also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. So the remnant will have the spirit of God. They will have the early and the latter rain. Micah tells us that during the time of the Sunday law crisis, the remnant who are swelling the message of the third angel to a loud cry, those seven shepherds and eight principal men, are a people of temperance and health who are being able to go forth and to do the work at the end of the world during the most stupendous crisis that will ever come upon or has ever come upon the earth. These are the individuals represented by the remnant. They are as the dew and as the showers. They have the early and the latter rain. They have received the outpouring of God's spirit. All right, so that's the other characteristic of the remnant. Now stay in Micah. We don't have to go far. We looked at Micah 7 how God is going to not only uh, pass by the iniquity, pass by the transgressions of the people, uh, of the remnant, meaning he's gonna forgive their sins, but the Bible also said that Christ is going to subdue their iniquities or our iniquities, meaning he's going to help us conquer our sins. We will be the overcomers that are seven times spoken about in Revelations chapter two and chapter three. We will be the overcomers. We will receive these seven blessings. Uh, to the seven churches. All the blessings to the seven churches are to those who overcome. We will have overcome sin. And as a result, the Bible shows we will be able to go forth swelling the loud cry in perfect health, and we will be a recipient of not only the early, but the latter rain. So now let's look at Micah chapter four. So we looked at Micah seven, we looked at Micah five. Now just turn back one chapter to Micah chapter four. Notice this, Micah chapter four. And the reason why I want to look at this particular verse is because some have a tendency to believe that the remnant that we talk about in the Bible will, uh, uh, and I'm trying to word this correctly, um, we don't look out of the, we don't look outside of our church. And what I'm talking about, that I'm talking about right now. In other words, Seventh-day Adventists, we like to compartmentalize and say, well, this promise is is, is just for us. We're uh, only represented as the virgins, or we're only represented as the remnant, so on and so forth. Um, and then the Bible is not necessarily saying that. Do I believe that those who will uh, be a part of the remnant will have accepted the faith of the Seventh-day Adventists? Of course I do, okay? Because we've already identified the remnant will be swelling the loud cry. The remnant have an experience. They have a message. And so those who will be a part of the remnant will have to have that. But I want you to notice Micah 4. Notice Micah 4. Look at Micah 4, chapter 1. Oh, excuse me, Micah chapter 4, verse 1. Micah chapter 4, verse 1. We're going to see that the remnant are literally going to be composed of every nation and kindred and tongue and people. Remember, our message is going forth to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. And if our message is going forth to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, and we're giving the loud cry, calling people to come out of Babylon, well, what are they going to be coming into? They're going to be coming into the truth. They're going to be coming into being a part of God's true church. And if they're coming out of Babylon and they're coming in at the end of the world, then they can be a part of the remnant. And so notice Micah chapter 4, verses 1 through 8. Micah chapter 4, verse 1 through 8. Notice what the Bible says. It says, but in the last days, very clear, in the last days, it shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains, and it shall be exalted above the hills, and people shall flow unto it. And of course, this is also mentioned in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 2. It says, in the last days, it's going to come to pass that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains, and it shall be exalted above the hills, and people shall flow into it, or unto it. And here, the mountain of the house of the Lord, this is the symbol of God's people, his church. It says, many nations shall come in verse two, many nations shall come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths, for the law shall go forth of Zion, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, and he shall judge among many people, and rebuke strong nations afar off. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, 
neither shall they learn war anymore, but they shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree, and none shall make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken it. For all people will walk, every one in the name of his God, and we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. Here is an interesting point in the context when you're reading this, all right, who are the ones speaking here? In Micah chapter four, it's the many nations that will come and speak. It's the many nations that are saying, hey, let's go up to the true house of God. Let's go up to God's true church. Let's learn of his laws. Let's learn of his ways. We're going to walk in his paths. We're going to keep his law. We're going to do his commandments. And it says that all the people, all the rest of the people, they're going to worship their own God, but we will walk in the name of the Lord, our God forever. These are the people that come out and join in with God's church. It says in verse eight, in that day saith the Lord, will I assemble her that halteth and I will gather her that is driven out and her that I have afflicted and I will make her that halteth a remnant and her that was cast off a strong nation and the Lord shall reign over them in Mount Zion from henceforth forever and uh, uh, henceforth, uh, even forever. And thou, O tower of the flock, the stronghold of the daughter of Zion, unto thee shall it come, even the first dominion, the kingdom shall come to the daughter of Jerusalem. The Bible tells us, the Bible is expressing to us very clear that the remnant who come out into God's holy mountain, they're composed of all the different nations of the world, it says, that's every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, and they will be given the kingdom and reign with God. And so the remnant is not just us now. I believe that the Seventh-day Adventist Church is the remnant church. I do believe that. But I also believe what, what Paul said, and that is not everyone who is of Israel or not everybody in Israel is really of Israel. Not everyone who is in the Seventh-day Adventist Church is really going to be God's remnant. They have to go through an experience. They have to be the ones that remain, those that are left, those that escape. What time period will that happen? Well, we've been reading in Micah, when the Assyrian comes into the land, the Sunday law crisis, there's going to be an event that takes place where the loud cry is swollen. The seven shepherds, the seven pillars of our faith gain power. The people of God who are following those eight shepherds, those eight, uh, 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 seven shepherds or eight principal men, the eight laws of health, those who are temperate. Bible says they're going to be giving a message. Scripture shows us here that those who are uh, 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 from the other nations, when God lifts up, when God exalts his, his mountain above the hills, when he lifts up his, uh, uh, his people, his church to be exalted above the hills, it says people are going to flow into it. These people are going to say, let's go to the house of God. Let's go to the house of Jacob. He's going to teach us of his ways. We're going to walk in his paths. The law is going to be going forth. We're going to walk in his ways and do them. All the rest of the people, they'll worship their own God, but we are going to worship the Lord our God forever and ever. They become a part of the people of God. And then from that point in Micah 4, they're referred to as the remnant. So the remnant are composed of all nations, kindred, tongues, and people, and will be given a place in the kingdom of God, and they will reign with God. So let's look now a little bit further into some more characteristics of the remnant. Ezra chapter 9. Ezra chapter 9. Let's go there. Ezra chapter 9. All right. So in Ezra the ninth chapter. Ezra the ninth chapter. Let's look together in the eighth verse. Ezra chapter 9. Let's go to the eighth verse, Ezra 9, verse 8, right? And we are looking now at the seventh characteristic. We've gone over six characteristics. We've talked about how the remnant are called and chosen. We've talked about how they're carried by God uh, from their birth. After their birth, they're carried by God. We talked about how their birth is a spiritual birth. It's being born again and being, being sustained by God's power. We talked about the fourth characteristic, which was how uh, the remnants have their sin. The remnant will have their sins not only forgiven, but conquered and cast away. We talked about how the remnant will have the spirit of God, the early and the latter rain. 
And then the sixth one, which we just covered, is how the remnant are going to be composed of every nation, kindred, tug, and people. And uh, they, the remnant, will be given the kingdom of God and they'll reign with him. All right. So let's look at uh, point number seven. So we're looking at point number seven. And we're in the book of Ezra, Ezra chapter nine. And we're going to verse eight. Ezra chapter nine. And we're looking at verse eight. The Bible says, and now for a little space, grace has been showed from the Lord our God to leave us a remnant to escape and to give us a nail in his sure place that our a little reviving in our bondage. So notice again, the remnant are those that escape, but it also is showing that the remnant are going to be having their eyes enlightened and they're going to have reviving in their bondage. It says in verse nine, for we were bondmen, yet our God hath not forsaken us in our bondage, but hath endured us, extended, excuse me, mercy unto us in the sight of the kings of Persia to give us a reviving and set up the house of our God and to repair the desolations thereof and to give us a wall in Jerusalem, uh, in Judah and in Jerusalem. And now, O our God, what shall we say after this? For we have forsaken thy commandments, which thou hast commanded by the ser thy servants, the prophets, saying, the land unto which ye go to possess it is an unclean land with the filthiness of the people of the lands, with their abominations, which they have filled from one end to the other with their uncleanness. Now, therefore, give not your daughter unto their sons, neither take their daughters unto your sons. It says, nor seek their peace or wealth forever, that ye may be strong and eat the good of the land and leave it for an inheritance to your children forever. And after all this has come upon us for our evil deeds and for our great trespass, seeing that thou, our God, hath punished us less than our iniquities deserve and has given us such deliverance as this, should we again break thy commandments? and join in affinity with the people of these abominations. It says, wouldest thou, wouldest not thou be angry with us till thou hast consumed us so that there should be no remnant, no escaping? All right, let's put this all together. So Ezra chapter nine starts off with how God is going to show grace and mercy and leave a remnant, right? And that remnant would have their eyes enlightened and the remnant would be revived in their bondage. Then those who are going to be composed of the remnant, they begin to consider their history, or consider their experience. And here in Ezra chapter 9, um, the people begin to literally consider how God sent them prophets, how God sent them the word, and how the word of the Lord encouraged them or instructed them to keep the commandments, how the word of the Lord instructed them to not be unequally yoked with unbelievers, how the word of the Lord instructed them to not take their sons uh, uh, under, you know, as their sons or the world's daughters as their daughters, how the people of God and the people of the world or the people of other faiths should not mingle together. And so they began to ex uh, go through their experience because they did all of that. They broke the commandments of God. They, 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 they were unequally yoked with unbelievers. And as a result, they were brought into bondage. As a result, they were scattered. And so they begin to consider their ways. And at the end, it says, listen, they begin to ask the question again, should we again break thy commandments? Should we again join an affinity with the people of these abominations? And it says, wouldest not thou be angry with us till thou hast consumed us so that there should be no remnant? So listen to me, friends. Those who are going to compose the remnant these are those who would have had an experience of being born again. Yes, they may have faltered and fallen in their past experience. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But God is not only going to forgive their sins, he's going to subdue their iniquities. And one of the things that comes to their mind that they recognize they cannot do is they have to be a special separate people. They cannot join in affinity with the world. They cannot be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. They cannot break the commandments of God because they will come to an understanding of this. If we do this, there would be no remnant. So therefore, the remnant friends, not only will they have a revival as we read about in Ezra chapter nine, not only will their eyes be enlightened, but one thing that has come to their understanding is they must be a separate and distinct people and not have affiliations with the people of the world. 
and what determines someone as a person of the world or an unbeliever is they have a different faith. It's clear in the scriptures. They can no longer break the commandments of God. They can no longer have affinity with those who are of, uh, unlike, who are not of precious faith. Otherwise, they will never compose the remnant at the end of the world. The Bible is clear. So one of the things that we see here in Ezra chapter nine as well is that they will keep the commandments of God. And so since we're talking about the remnant, keeping the commandments of God, I want you to flip over to Revelation. Go to Revelation chapter 14. So go with me to Revelation chapter 14. Let's talk about the remnant there and um, bring out some, some, some thoughts uh, about the remnant in the book of Revelation. So we'll stick in the book of Revelation at least for about four scriptures. So Revelation chapter 14, verse 12. This is a verse that at least in our, in our church, the Three Angels Fellowship, uh, uh, very regularly we, we state or say as part of our affirmation of faith as we talk about the first, second, and third angel. So Revelation 14, 12, a verse that we all know very well. It says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So according to Ezra, we know that those who are gonna keep the commandment are the remnant. So in Revelation 14, verse 12, the saints being referred to here that will keep the commandments of God are clearly the remnant. We'll see that very clear. The remnant are going to be keeping the commandments of God. But not only are they keeping the commandments of God, they also keep the faith of Jesus. Right? Not only the commandments, but the faith of Jesus. All right. So flip over to Revelation chapter 12. Go back to chapters. Revelation chapter 12. And let's look at verse 17. So last verse of the chapter, Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17. Here we're going to clearly see that it's the remnant who are keeping the commandments of God. All right, so Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17. Notice what the Bible says. Scripture says, and the dragon was wroth with the woman, with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. So here's the remnant which keep the commandments of God. So clearly the remnant keep the commandments of God. And it says, and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So, so far we know that the remnant keep the commandments of God. If we connect Revelation 12, 17 and Revelation 14, verse 12, the saints that are spoken of in Revelation 14, 12, that keep the commandments are the remnant, okay? Or the remnant will be keeping the commandments. Not only will they be keeping the commandments, but they'll have also keep the faith of Jesus, okay? The faith of Jesus, the lifestyle of Jesus, the, the, the character of Jesus, that was Jesus did. That's how, what he lived, his manner, his, his ways. The remnant will keep the faith of Jesus. They will have the righteousness by faith experience. But also in verse 17 of Revelation chapter 12, it says the remnant will have the testimony of Jesus Christ. They keep the faith of Jesus, but they also have the testimony of Jesus. And we know, Revelation 19, 10, for those that have never maybe uh, connected these verses before, we're gonna, go, we're gonna go there. Let's find out what the testimony of Jesus is that the remnant will also have. They keep the commandments of God, but they also have the testimony of Jesus Christ. What is that? How do we know we'll be a part of the remnant? How do we know we're in the right place? Look at Revelation 19, verse 10. What is the testimony of Jesus Christ? In Revelation chapter 19, verse 10, here John has an experience where he's so overwhelmed by the glory of the scenes and the things that he's being taught that he falls at the foot of the angel to worship him. It says, I fell at his feet to worship him, verse 10 of chapter 19, and he said unto me, see thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Okay, remember the remnant that are gonna be made war, that are gonna be a warred against by the dragon, they not only keep the commandments, but they have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Here, John is uh, uh, falling at the foot of the angel and the angel says, don't worship with me, don't do that. I'm of your fellow brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. All right, what is the testimony of Jesus? It says, worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So the remnant keep the commandments of God, all 10, including the Sabbath. The remnant keep the faith of Jesus. They have the experience of righteousness by faith. 
and the remnant have the testimony of Jesus Christ, which is the spirit of prophecy. Now let's broaden it a little bit. Let's broaden our perspective of what the spirit of prophecy is. All right, look at Revelation chapter 22. Revelation chapter 22. And we're going to look in verse 8 and verse 9. Revelation chapter 22, verses 8 and 9. Notice John is again having the experience of being overwhelmed by the glory of the vision, being overwhelmed by the angel that is instructing him in these things. And the Bible says, and I, John, saw these things and I heard them. And when I had heard and seen, I fell down at the feet to worship the feet of the angel, which showed me these things. Second time he had this experience. Verse 9 says, then saith he unto me, see thou do it not. For I am of thy fellow servant and of thy brethren, the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book, worship God. So when we put Revelation 19, verse 10, and Revelation 22, verse 8 and 9 together, we learn that the testimony of Jesus Christ, which is the spirit of prophecy, is the testimony or spirit of the prophets, the prophets as a whole. Right? And what this represents for us is that the remnant, the people who are known as the remnant at the end of time, they will have the gift of prophecy. The spiritual gift of the prophet will be seen in that church or in that group of people at the end of the world. You know, there's many churches that will keep the Ten Commandments. All right. For an example, some will say, well, you know, the Seventh-day Baptists, they, they keep the commandments of God. That's true. But the Seventh-day Baptists, they don't have the gift of the spirit of prophecy within their church. They don't, they don't believe there's any prophets outside of the canon of the scripture. And so therefore, the gift of the spirit or the gift of the prophet that God promised would be in the church till the end of time, they don't have. All right. So notice, if matter of fact, if you flip over to Ephesians chapter 4, if you flip over to Ephesians chapter 4, let's talk about this gift this gift of the prophet, and what's the purpose of this gift. So this is identifying for us that the church that is identified as being the remnant, that, that church that the people of the world are going to flow into and become a part of that remnant, um, the Bible is going to identify for us that they have all the spiritual gifts in the church. So Ephesians chapter 4, let's look there. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse, uh, let's start in verse 8, then we'll jump into verse 11. So Ephesians chapter 4 verses 8, then we'll go to verse 11. Notice again what it says. It says, wherefore he saith, when he, when Christ ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. So when Christ was resurrected and he ascended to heaven, the Bible said he led captivity captive. That's referring to the multitude that he took with him to heaven, that he resurrected at his resurrection, all right, that were resurrected at his resurrection. The Bible says that he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive, and then it says he gave gifts unto men. One of the gifts that Christ gave to his people as a result of his ascension. The Bible says in verse 11, he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Let's pause now. Right? Are uh, 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 pastors and teachers and evangelists and apostles still within the church today? Most churches that operate will say, well, yeah, we have pastors, we have teachers, we have evangelists, apostles are those that go around and raise up churches, all right? So, yeah, that's, that's all part of our church. So we have the gifts. Well, the one that most don't is a prophet, all right? The Bible says that he gave some apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers. Why did he give these gifts to the church? It says, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Okay, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie, lie, they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth and love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head even Christ from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, making, uh, 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 making increase in the body unto the edifying of itself in love. 
The Bible shows that the gifts that Christ gave will be in the church until the saints are perfected until the ministry has fully worked, until the body of Christ is edified, until all are in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, until all are perfect men and women in Christ, coming up to the fullness of the measure of the stature of Christ, not tossed around by any winds of doctrine. They are solid as a rock in their beliefs. Friends, this experience has not fully happened yet in any church. And so therefore, therefore, the gifts of the spirit that God has specifically given to his remnant church will be in that church till the end. So the remnant church are, are identified as having the spirit of prophecy or the spiritual gift of a prophet. Now, we, we've talked, you know, uh, about eight points, eight points now. So let's look at the ninth, nine, 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 let's look at 10 points. So we're gonna look at the ninth point and the 10th point. So we talked about eight points we'll review in just a moment, but let's talk about point number nine now. All right, so go with me in the scriptures to the book of Zephaniah. Go with me in the scriptures to the book of Zephaniah. And this, this particular chapter, chapter three in, in the book of Zephaniah is going to uh, identify for us uh, some wonderful things about the remnant, but it's going to identify for us also a time period when the remnant are going to be formed, all right? So Zephaniah chapter 3 is where we're going. Verse 8 is where we're starting, and I think this is very important for us because there are many who believe that, excuse me, that the remnant are already formed, all right? But that's not the case. The remnant church is alive and well in the world, yes. The remnant church they keep all the commandments of God. They have the spiritual gift of a prophet. They, they believe and, and are experiencing the, the message of righteousness by faith, keeping the faith of Jesus. But not everyone who's a part of that church is going to be a part of the remnant. All right. Remember, there has to be an experience they go through. And that experience is when the king of Assyria comes into the land, the king of the north. And that is yet to happen. We're on the brinks of this happening. But God's people are going to be those that are left out of that terrible experience known as the time of trouble. They are going to be those that are left, that remain, that escape from the things that are taking place within uh, their land and within their borders. So point being, the remnant have not yet emerged. We read in Revelation chapter 12, verse 17, that the dragon goes forth to make war with the remnant. That has yet to happen. And so therefore the remnant as identified in the Bible have not yet emerged. Yet we can go through the Bible and we can identify the characteristics that the remnant would have. And since all of us should be striving to be a part of that remnant, every single thing that we have been going through, we need to experience whether we are a part of the remnant or not. We must be called and we must be chosen. We must have our sins forgiven. We must have our sins, our iniquities subdued and conquered. We must have that experience. We must be born again, whether we're a part of the remnant that remains at the end of time or not. In order to be saved, we must have that experience. So as we're going through the remnant, it's identifying God's people as, a, it's identifying characteristics that all of God's people must have. If we're really wanting to be a part of the remnant, we will have these experiences, all right? So look at Zephaniah, Zephaniah chapter three. And the reason why I wanna emphasize that is because we can't say, well, I just won't be a part of the remnant then. I don't need to overcome my sin. I don't need to uh, not be unequally, uh, you know, I don't need to not be unequally yoked. I can you know, play around with the people of the world or with others who are not of our faith and, and I can continue to sin. We can do all of these things and, you know, I believe in God. I love God. I just won't be a part of the remnant, friends. If we have that experience, we won't be saved at all. We won't escape this world. We'll be here when it's set on fire by God from heaven. We don't want that experience. All right. So notice, notice a little bit more about the remnant. Zephaniah chapter three, verse eight. And I'm going to read, I'm going to read to verse 20. So follow along. We're going to see characteristics of the remnant, but also we're going to see a time when the remnant emerge. So it says in verse eight, it says, therefore, wait ye upon me, saith the Lord, 
until the day that I raise up to the prey. Your God is saying, wait for me until I raise up. We know what happens when God raises up, when he stands up. This is when probation closes, right? He says, wait for me until I, the day that I raise up to the prey, for my determination is to gather the nations, that I may assemble the kingdoms, to pour upon them mine indignation, even all my fierce anger, for all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. When God stands up here, when he raises up to the prey, this is when he's gathering the nations to pour upon them his fury, his anger, his wrath. We know this is the plagues, all right? This is the close of probation that's being spoken of here. Look at verse, verse uh, uh, nine. For then will I turn to the people a pure language, that they shall all call upon the name of the Lord and serve me with one consent. From beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, my suppliants, even the daughter of my dispersed, shall bring mine offering. In that day shall thou not be ashamed for all thy doings, where thou hast transgressed against me. For then will I take away out of the midst of thee them that rejoice in thy pride, and, and thou shalt no more, and thou shalt no more be haughty because of my holy mountain. I will also leave in the midst of thee and afflicted and poor people, and they shall trust in the name of the Lord. All right. So this is very interesting when, you know, God is talking about a time period where he's going to close probation. He's going to raise up. He's going to pour out his wrath. He's talking about this time period. He said, when that happens, uh, when this time period happens, God is going to have cleansed his people. Nobody's going to be uh, haughty, he said, because of his holy mountain. You know, some people think, well, I'm part of this church. I'm part of that church. I know this. I know that's all right. God says people that have that, that big headed experience, of experience of being cutty because of the holy mountain, he said, I'm going to cleanse them out. He also talks about there's not going to be any iniquity anymore. Uh, there, there's not going to be any that, that, that rejoice in pride anymore. He says he's going to leave in, in he's going to leave behind and afflicted and poor people. And I think this is very interesting when Sister White talks about the experience of God's church being cleansed when she's writing about the overflowing scourge and God is uh, uh, sending the, the, this is the, the crisis of the, the mark of the beast crisis, the Sunday law crisis, how God is thoroughly purging his floor with, the, with his fan. She talks about how the sinners in Zion will be sifted out. She talks about how God's church will be purified. It will go from being the church, uh, 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 the, the church, uh, it will go into becoming the church uh, magnificent, the, the glorious church, the church triumphant. It will no longer be the church militant, she ref refers to. And she talks about the people that will, will remain, the people that will be left. You know, these will be a humble people. These will be people who are not caught up in themselves, never really desired to be lifted up in a position. God will use those who have been humble. That's what the Bible talks about. This is what the spirit of prophecy is referring to. Notice what it continues on to say in verse 13. Here's the remnant. The remnant of Israel. Remember, here's the time period where God is sifting his church. He's separating the, the, the gold from the dross, the wheat from the tares. He's, he's ready to pour out his spirit. He's ready to close probation. Now the remnant are talked about. Listen, he says in verse 13, the remnant of Israel, remember those that are left, those that remain, those that escape from the experience that's being spoken of here, it says the remnant shall not do iniquity, nor speak lies, neither shall a deceitful tongue be found in their mouth, for they shall feed and lie down, and none shall make them afraid. Sing, O daughter of Zion, shout, O Israel, be glad and rejoice with all the heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord hath taken away thy judgments. He hath cast out thy, thine enemy. The king of Israel, even the Lord, is in the midst of thee. He shall, you shall not see evil anymore. In that day, it shall be said to Jerusalem, fear thou not. And to Zion, let not thine hand be slack. The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save. He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. I will gather them that are sorrowful for the solemn assembly who are of thee to whom the reproach of it was a burden. Behold, at that time, I will undo all that afflict thee. I will save her that halteth, gather her that was driven out. I will, sit, I will get them praise and fame in every land where they have been put to shame. At that time, I will bring you again, even in the time that I gather you, for I will make you a name and a praise among all people of the earth when I turn back your captivity before their eyes, saith the Lord. 
The Bible identifies the time. The Bible identifies the people and their experience. Here, the remnant, the Bible shows they're not doing iniquity. There's no lies. There's no deceitful tongue found in their mouth. They're going to have an experience where they're going to be separated from all the sinners in Zion, all the other nations that were not a part of God's people as well. And the Bible says that Christ is going to pour upon them his wrath and his anger. This is when the remnant emerge. This is when you see the remnant identified in this experience. And we've studied this before in, in other ways. We know that right before Michael stands up, right before he closes probation, right before his wrath is poured out, he numbers his people, the saints that are left, the remnant, the 144,000 friends. And how do we know the 144,000 are the remnant? Well, we read about the remnant here here in the book of Zephaniah chapter 3, they don't have any uh, deceitful tongue in their mouth. They don't speak lies. They don't do iniquity. Notice what the Bible says in Revelation 14. Flip over there with me to Revelation chapter 14. So Revelation, the 14th chapter. Let's, let's tie this in with what we read, we, we just read in Zephaniah. So Revelation 14, look at verse, verse, verse 1. Revelation 14, verse 1. The Bible says, and I looked and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion and with him 140 and 4,000, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung as it were a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and before the angels, uh, the elders. And no man can learn that song but the 144,000, which were redeemed from the earth. Let's pause there. Here the Bible is identifying a number, 144,000. They are keeping the commandments of God. They have the Father's name written in their foreheads and they're singing a new song that nobody else can learn. Why? Because nobody else has experienced. The song that the 144,000 sing is the song of their experience. Nobody else can sing it because you have to go through an experience. Just like we've learned, the remnant are those that are left, those that remain, those that are escaped. They are the ones that are going through an experience. And the Bible identifies them. Listen, it says, these are they which were not defiled with women for they are virgins. They have a pure faith, a pure truth. These are they which follow the lamb whithersoever he goeth. Remember, they're keeping the faith of Jesus. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. To have guile in their mouth means to have a forked tongue a double tongue, to be having lies in your mouth. Remember, Zephaniah says the remnant, they don't speak lies. The remnant do no iniquity. There's no deceitful tongue in their mouth. Here's the remnant, 144,000 that were redeemed from the earth. The Bible identifies there's no guile found in their mouth. They have the experience of God's uh, name in their forehead, his character, also his seal in Revelation uh, chapter seven, verses one through four, we know this is the stealing of 144,000. And so friends, the remnant we know are going to be specifically the 144,000. They're gonna be called and chosen. We know that they're gonna be carried by God from their birth, meaning anyone who's a part of the 144,000 would have had to have been born again. And so listen, we've been told, we've been encouraged We've been instructed by the prophet of God that we should strive with all the power in our being to be a part of the 144,000, to be a part of the remnant. And as we've been going through the characteristics, friends, everyone in reality who are going to be saved would have had to have, had to have this experience. We would have had to come to a point where God has called us and finally chosen us because of our choice of following the Lord with all of our heart. The Bible says that we would have had to have been born again. And from the time of our rebirth, God will be carrying us. He'll sustain us by his power. That born again experience being sustained by the power of God. We talked about how that power of God will sustain us to keep from falling, to overcome our sins. Christ is going to subdue our iniquities. We talked about that. We talked about how the, uh, uh, the remnant are going to have the experience of the early and the latter rain. The early rain is what caused the seed of God's word to germinate. The latter rain is what ripens the grain and prepares it for the harvest. Everyone of God's saved people will have to have this experience. The Bible shows that the remnant 
is not just composed of those who are now within the Southern Church today, but will be, be composed of those who come out at the Lord of Pride, who come out and join with the people of God. They too will be composed, that will compose the remnant. They come out of every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, and they will receive the kingdom of God and reign with God. We've read this in the Bible. The remnant have an experience of revival, we saw. As a result, they keep the commandments of God. The remnant have the spirit of prophecy. They have a, the spiritual gift of the prophet. They would have accepted the spiritual gift. They would have accepted the prophet of God. The remnant don't do iniquity. There's no more sin. There's no lies. They don't speak lies. They don't practice lies. They don't have a deceitful tongue in their mouth. This is the overcoming experience as the Bible identifies the remnant. And finally, the remnant are formed or identified right before the wrath of God goes forth in the earth. These are the characteristics. These are the things the Bible has identified of the remnant. You and I, we might be a part of the remnant church, but will we be a part of the remnant? Are we having this experience of the things that we read through today? Are we seeking to not just have sin forgiven, but to overcome? Are we sorry for our sins? And if we're sorry for our sins, are we putting those things away? This is the experience we must have. And all of us must have this experience. We must all overcome our sins, big and little. We have, not, we have to have the experience of not being duplicitous, not having a deceitful or forked tongue in our mouth. We have to be virgins. We have to have a pure faith, a pure experience. We have to follow the lamb whithersoever he goeth, meaning we need to have the character or faith of Jesus. But what does all this have to do with Noah, Daniel, and Job? Remember, that's how we started, right? Noah, Daniel, and Job. Go, go back just for a refresher to the book of Ezekiel chapter 14. Go back to Ezekiel chapter 14, and we're just going to uh, uh, read verse 19 and 20. All right, so uh, Job, uh, Ezekiel, excuse me, chapter 14, and we're just going to look in verse 19 and 20. We, we, we had looked in Ezekiel chapter 14, 12 through 22. But for time's sake, let's just look at verses 19 through 20. The Bible says, If I send pestilence in the land and pour out my fury upon it in blood to cut off from it man and beast, though Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it as I live, saith the Lord, they shall deliver neither son nor daughter. They shall but deliver their own souls by their righteousness. For thus saith the Lord, we'll read verse 21, the Lord God, how much more when I send my four sword judgments upon Jerusalem, the sword, the famine, the noise, and beast, the pestilence, to cut off from it man and beast, verse 22, yet behold, there shall be left a remnant that should be brought forth. So Noah, Daniel, and Job, a symbol of the remnant that will be brought forth, a symbol of the remnant that will escape the remnant at the end of time who are going to help swell the loud cry, help swell uh, the, the truths of the, the, the seven pillars and the eight principal men uh, uh, experience. You know, why Noah, Daniel, and Job? Remember, we talked about the order. In reality, it should be Noah, Job, Daniel, but it's Noah, Daniel, and Job. It's three of them representing the first, second, and third angel. How indeed are they representing the first, second, and third angel? Well, <clears throat> we know based on, we know based on Revelation chapter 14, let's just do some, some quick uh, uh, identification marks. So in Revelation 14 verses one through five, which we've read together, we know that the remnant there are referred to as 144,000. They are redeemed from the earth. They're, they're following the lamb whithersoever he goeth. They have the pure faith. They have no guile in their mouth, right? They're without fault before the throne. We, we've seen that from verse one through five. We've also seen that in verse 12, the patience of the saints is referred to those that keep the commandments of God have the faith of Jesus. And we know that that was the remnant. So verses one through five, we know is referring to the remnant. Verse 12, we know is referring to the remnant. Well, what about verses six through, six through 11? What about those verses in between? Now we know from verses six to 11, we have the introduction of the first angel, second angel, and third angel. And what I want to do with you, uh, uh, not, not in great detail, but enough where we can see this, is we want to go through the story and life of Noah, Daniel, and Job, and we're going to see that they, in that order, represent the first, the second, and the third angel. Noah, the first angel. Daniel, the second angel. 
Job, the third angel. They are representing the experience, the life, the character of the remnant people who will give the first, second, third angel. Remember, the first, second, third angel's messages are not just messages. They are people who will be giving these messages, all right? Because though they're the represented as the angels, the messengers that are giving the messengers. So Noah, Daniel, and Job should represent you and I. And if it's to represent you and I, then let's look at Noah. Let's look at Daniel. Let's look at Job and let's see how they fit into those categories as first, second, and third angel and how it should apply to us and to the characteristics of the remnant that we've just read. So let's do this quickly. Let's go to Genesis chapter six. Let's talk about Noah. Genesis chapter six. Genesis the sixth chapter and we're going to the third verse. Genesis chapter six. And we wanna look at verse three together. Genesis six, verse three. Then we'll read Genesis five, verse Verse not up. Uh, uh, Genesis chapter 6, verse 5 through 9. All right, so Genesis chapter 6, 3, and then verses 5 through 9. Bible says, And the Lord said, My spirit will not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. And the God saw, in verse 5, that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and creeping thing and the fowls of the air. For it repented me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. So look at this about Noah. The Bible shows that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. The Bible shows that Noah was a just man. He was a perfect man in his generations, and he walked with God. Remember, two cannot walk together except to be agreed, meaning that Noah was in agreement with God, or God was in agreement with Noah. They were walking hand in hand. God looked upon Noah and said, that's my man. That's my, that's my people. He was perfect. He was just. And he walked with God. And he found grace in the eyes of God during the time when the whole world was an apostasy. That's the experience that we're going to have at the end of the world. We're entering into that time. We can already see the world now is turning topsy-turvy. People are starting to take sides. We can already see that wickedness is proliferating in the world. And God is going to need a people who are just, who are perfect, and who walk with him. But let's look a little bit further at this story, because the Bible says that during this time period where God called Noah, God had said, listen, I'm going to give a time period for man. I'm going to put man on probation. His days will be 120 years, meaning that God was going to call, uh, call Noah, and there will be a 120-year period. What was Noah doing for 120 years? We were saying, well, he was building an ark, right? He was, he was building an ark. Is that all he was doing was building the ark? The Bible says something different. If you look in 2 Peter, if you look in 2 Peter chapter 2, and you look in verse 4 and 5, the Bible says that Noah was not just building an ark. Listen to what Noah was doing. It says, for if God spared not the angels that sinned in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved into judgment and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. Bible says that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. Noah preached righteousness. Question, what do you think Noah's sermons were about? He was a preacher. Do you think that Noah was preaching about the judgments of God that were about to come? Do you think that Noah's message was that the hour of God's judgment has come upon the earth? Of course. Noah was instructing people to get on board this ark that I'm preparing because God's judgments were coming upon the earth. Noah is a perfect representation of the first angel's message. Not only was he a righteous man, a perfect man, a just man who walked with God, but he's the one that gave to the world the message of the hour of God's judgment. 
And we know that's the first angel's message. We know Revelation 14, 6 through 7, how we see another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell upon the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, sing with a loud voice, fear God, give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him that made heaven and earth, the sea and the fountains of waters. We know that's the message. That was the message that God was giving through Noah. The hour of his judgment was come. Noah is the first angel, perfect representation. Well, the Bible said in Ezekiel, it goes from Noah to Daniel. So therefore, if Noah is the first angel, Daniel must be the second. What is the second angel? Well, we know that the second angel's message is Babylon is fallen. Who gave that message? Go with me to Daniel. All right, let's look at some of the characteristics of Daniel. Let's look what the Bible says in Daniel chapter one. Daniel chapter one. Look at what scripture says with me uh, in Daniel chapter one, verses three through eight. So we've gone through some of the characteristics of the remnant. Uh, we've talked about how the remnant um, are not only gonna be giving the message of the first, second, and third angel, but they have an experience as well. Not only are they going to raise up the seven shepherds, which are the seven pillars of their faith, but they also have the eight principal men, the laws of hell. Does Daniel fit that bill? Look at what it says in Daniel chapter one, verses three through eight. And I'm so appreciative that we're studying the book of Daniel in our Sabbath school class, because the very first chapter deals with the lifestyle of the remnant. The Bible says, in verse three, and the king spake to Aphinehas, the master of his, his eunuchs, that he would bring certain of the children of Israel and the king's seed and of the princes, children in whom was no blemish, but well favored and skillful in all wisdom and cunning and knowledge and understanding science and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years, that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. Now among these were the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names, for unto Daniel the name of Belteshazzar, and the Hananiah Shadrach, to Mishael of Meshach, and of Azariah of Abednego, but Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. And we know the Bible goes on to say that he wanted a, a, a 10 day test to come upon them. Look at verse 15. All right. At, uh, 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 excuse me, verse 12. It says, Prove thy servants, I beseech thee, 10 days. And let us get and let them give us pulse to eat and water to drink. And it says in verse 15, at the end of the 10 days, their countenance appeared fair and fatter in flesh than all the children that did eat the portion of the king's meat. Thus Melzar took away the portion of their meat and the wine which they drank and gave them pulse. Uh, as for these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Friends, the Bible shows us that Daniel who is the man under discussion now, had a lifestyle that was purely vegetable, a, a diet that was purely vegetable. As a result, God gave him wisdom and learning, not just in the things of the earth, not just the sciences and history, but the Bible says that he had the understanding of visions and dreams. Daniel experienced the gift of the spirit of prophecy. Remember the remnant had that. Here the Bible shows that Daniel had the lifestyle, Daniel, his, he, he has the gifts that the remnant will have as well. The Bible shows in Daniel, the sixth chapter. Let's do this quickly here. In Daniel chapter six, verse three through four, we know the story of Daniel, which is why I'm going through it kind of fast here. But in Daniel chapter three, uh, excuse me, Daniel chapter six, verse three through four, it says, Daniel was preferred above the presidents and princes because an excellent spirit was in him and the king thought to set him over the whole realm. Then the presidents and the princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find none occasion or fault, for as much as he was faithful, neither was there any error or fault found in him. Notice another characteristic of Daniel. Not only was he uh, living a, a healthy lifestyle, not only did he have the gifts of the spirit, which are things that the remnant do, but in chapter six of Daniel, the Bible said the men tried to find in him occasion concerning the kingdom. In other words, they were trying to see, was Daniel a good citizen? Did Daniel pay his taxes? Did Daniel, you know, 
uh, uh, follow the laws of the land. Let's see if we can find something on Daniel. And the Bible said that they did a diligent search and they can find no fault because he was faithful. There was no error or fault found in him. The Bible mentions that Daniel not only was spiritually correct, but he was a good citizen as well. Friends, what's the with the remnant? You're not to have. You're not going to have anybody in the remnant who are going to be breaking the laws of the land and 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 trying to get one over on the governments that be, and yet at the same time be faithful to God. You won't find that. So Daniel not only was faithful to God, but he was a good citizen. Now, of course, Daniel only followed just laws because an unjust law is no law at all. And so, notice in Daniel chapter six, verse ten when they tried to change the law and make it against his God, that you find Daniel still going, still praying three times a day, you find him going and praying before the Lord. So he didn't follow that law of the land because it encroached upon the law of his God. And again, that's an experience the remnant will go through. The remnant are, are going to have to follow the laws of God over the laws of men when, of course, they encroach upon God's law. And we know that Daniel in chapter five, we won't go through this whole story, but in Daniel chapter five, we know that Daniel was brought in to give an uh, a, a interpretation of the writing on the wall, the many, many techo use farson. And what was that? What was it? What, what did it represent? What Daniel was telling the king of Babylon is that Babylon was fallen. That very night, we know that the, that Darius comes in, uh, and, and we know that Medes and the Persians come in, and they 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 take the kingdom, and Belshazzar was slain in that night. We know this. So Daniel's lifestyle, Daniel's experience as a citizen, and Daniel's message is a perfect representation of the remnant and what the remnant will do and go through. And Daniel therefore is a perfect representation of the second angel because Daniel gives the message of the fall of Babylon, right? And in chapter five, you see Babylon uh, identified there as drinking wine and you know, Belshazzar is getting everyone drunk with wine. Second angel. So it went from no other first angel to Daniel, the second angel. We look at the characteristic and lifestyle and message of Noah. We know that he perfectly represents the first angel and the people who will give the first angel. We look at the lifestyle, the message and the characteristics of Daniel. And we know that Daniel perfectly represents the message of the second angel and the people of the second angel. He represents the remnant. And then finally, as we draw this to a close, we know that in Revelation, or excuse me, in uh, the book of Job now, I want you to go with me to Job. Go with me to Job, all right? Go with me to Job. Let's look at Job. Job is the last individual under discussion because it went from Noah, Daniel, to Job in Ezekiel chapter 14. Noah, first angel. Daniel, second angel. Job, third angel. Let's look at the lifestyle and the experience and characteristics of Job, and we'll see it represents the third angel. So the Bible says in Job chapter one, look with me in verse one, Job chapter one and verse one. The Bible says there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright, one that feared God and eschewed or shunned the evil. Well, friends, as we've gone through the remnant, as we've looked at what the remnant experience was, we know that this is the experience of the remnant. They have to overcome. They have to be upright. They have to fear God and keep his commandments. And they have to do uh, uh, issue evil or do away with evil, do away with sin. This is Job. Job is a characteristic of a remnant. The whole book of Job is actually written as a, a playbook for the remnant at the end of time. As a matter of fact, if you look at Job chapter 1, verse 13, in Job 1.13, you have these events that begin to take place. And we won't, uh, well, let's just read through them from verse 13 to 22. The Bible says, there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in the eldest brother's house. And there came a messenger unto Job and said, the oxen were plowing, the asses feeding beside them, and the Sabaeans fell upon them and took them away. Yea, and they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. 
If you study who the Sabaeans are, you know the Sabaeans are the children of the East. You know the Sabaeans are the offspring of Ishmael. The Sabaeans are a representation of the Mohammedans or Islam. You might say, well, wait a minute, that's, that's interesting. Well, listen, if you go on in verse 16, it says, while he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, the fire of God has fallen from heaven and hath burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them. And I only am alone to, I only am escaped alone to tell thee. So after the Sabaeans, after Islam is, uh, is introduced, then the fire falls from heaven. What does that sound like? That's Revelation 13. Remember, fire comes down from heaven upon the earth to deceive men, to deceive them to do what? Well, to worship the beast, to join in with the affinity of the beast power and to receive the mark of the beast. What do we have happening in the story of Job? After the Sabaeans come, Islam is introduced in, in history, right? In the story of Job, then the fire comes down from heaven. What's the third thing that happens? Look at verse 17. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, the Chaldeans, Babylon, they've made out three bands and for yea, and slain the servants, uh, slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Wait a minute. Sabaeans, then the fire comes, then Babylon or the Chaldeans are composed of three parts. What are the three parts of Babylon? Revelation 16, dragon beast, false prophet. So here we see Islam, then we see the fire from heaven. Then we see Babylon composed of three parts. In other words, the dragon beast, false prophet have come together. And we know in Bible prophecy that when these three hands join, it leads the world into the great apostasy of the Sunday law. And so notice what happens next. The Bible says in verse 18, while he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house and it fell upon the young men and they are dead. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee the last event here in chapter one that happened after the Sabaeans, the fire, the three bands of Babylon is the wind of the storm that destroys the structure and the great wind in Bible prophecy, whether it's in the book of Isaiah, or whether it's in the book of Ezekiel, or whether it's in the book of uh, 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 Revelation and Jeremiah and other places, that great wind known as the overflowing scourge, the overflowing storm and showers. Jesus spoke about it in Matthew chapter seven. We know that this is the Sunday law. And so it started off with the Sabaeans. Dare I say, number 11, 2001. Dare I bring in where the, the third woe uh, would enter into prophetic history. Then it comes to the great events of spiritualism being fired out, bringing fire down from heaven, galvanizing the world into the three parts, putting all the hands together through the powers of spiritualism. Babylon joins in affinity one with another. And then the Sunday law is brought upon the earth. We know that's Revelation 13. Point by point, this is the experience of Job. And notice what the Bible says in verse 20 about Job. It says, then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worship and said, naked came out of my mother's womb and naked shall I return thither. And God gave and the Lord, the Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job sinned not nor charged not foolishly. Job, who was a symbol of the remnant people, who will go through the experience that we have just mentioned from the introduction of the third age, uh, the third woe, all the way to the Sunday law crisis. The Bible shows that they will have to have done and had an experience where they would not sin. Thus was Job. Thus Job is a part of the remnant. Job goes through the experience of what we know under the third angel's message. But the story of Job is very deep because as you go through Job's story, you know, sometimes characters in the Bible can represent two different classes of men. We know that when you study Peter, Peter represents both the publican and the Pharisee in his experience. And Job has an experience that he's, he's, that is being represented here. And when you get into Job chapter two, after he goes through the experience leading up to the Sunday law, in chapter two, you have his wife, you know, saying, curse God and die. Job represents her as one of the foolish women. In other words, Sunday law comes, now you have the experience of the wise and foolish are separated. But then Job ends up receiving the very first plague. He receives the boils. You know, Revelation 16, verse 1 and 2, he receives that plague. 
right? And so the story and experience of Job is the story and experience of those who will live under the third angel's message. And so Job is a perfect experience uh, of those who will undergo the third angel. Let's look at one other text regarding Job before we close, because this is important to see as well. I want you to flip over to chapter 16. Go with me to chapter uh, 16. Uh, there's something that takes place here in chapter 16. So his wife in chapter two has already told him to curse God and die. She's no longer on his side. You know, his children are gone. Uh, his wife's turned against him. Now look in chapter 16. We know his, his friends have come to try to cheer him up and encourage him. At least that's what it appears. But instead, they really came to, to cast contempt upon Job. And so Job says to them in verse one, then Job answered and said, I have heard many such things. Miserable comforters are you all. Shall vain words have an end? Or what emboldeneth thee that thou answerest? I could, I also could speak as ye do, if your soul were in my soul's stead. I could heap up words against you and shake mine head, uh, head at you, but I would strengthen you with my mouth, and the moving of my lips would assuage your grief. Though I speak, my grief is not assuaged, and though I forbear, what am I eased? But now he hath made me weary. It says, thou hast made desolate all my company. And thou hast filled me with wrinkles, which is a witness against me. And my leanness rising up in me beareth witness to my face. He teareth me in his wrath. He hateth me. He gnasheth upon me with his teeth. My enemy sharpeneth his eyes upon me. They have gaped upon me with their mouth. They have smitten me in the cheek reproachfully. They have gathered themselves together against me. God hath delivered me to the ungodly and turned me over into the hands of the wicked. Here is Job and his experience. He comes to the point where every earthly support is cut off. His wife has turned against him. His friends, he represents as miserable comforters. In verse 11, he represents them as being the ungodly. I, I, I forget what chapter, but he, he calls them as well, you know, uh, 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 false physicians, you know, or, 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 or terrible physicians. In other words, that could bring no healing. Job was all alone. Every earthly support was cut off. Don't we recognize that when we study Bible prophecy that those who will go through the great time of trouble or the time of trouble leading to the great time of trouble, those who go through the time of trouble will have every earthly support cut off from them? This is the third angel. So Job is a perfect representation of the character of those who will be giving the message. Remember, being perfect, upright, fearing God, eschewing evil, doing no sin in the midst of these, the experience. But his whole story is a point by point layout of the events in their order of what will happen to the remnant people. Job is therefore the third angel. So when Ezekiel says, though Noah, Daniel, and Job were in the land, they would deliver neither son nor daughter, they would deliver their own souls by their righteousness. Friends, this is something that we need to take heed to. We need to take this to heart. The experience of Noah, the experience of Job, and the, or Daniel, and the experience of Job is the experience of the people who will compose the remnant at the end of the world. They will not be able to transfer their experience or their righteousness to their family. They will not be able to give their experience to their children. They will not be able to give their experience to their spouse. It will be an individual experience. If you and I are going to make it in the end, if you and I are going to go through, if you and I are going to be represented as the remnant, then we need to have an individual experience. We need to be born again. We need to be called and chosen. We need to be sustained by God. We need to have our sins forgiven. We need to have our sins conquered. We need to have the experience of the early and the latter rain. We need to have these experiences. If we do not have them, we will not be considered as Noah, as Daniel, and as Job. Let us pray. Father in heaven, Lord, today you have laid out before us both the characteristics and experience of the remnant. You have also shown us, Lord, that it is an individual experience. It is an individual undertaking. 
Lord, Noah, Daniel, and Joel, the Bible said, cannot transfer these this experience to their children. They may have had the experience, but that experience wouldn't save their children, wouldn't save their family. Lord, may we understand that that is indeed the case. May we recognize, Lord, that individually we must make our calling and election sure. And I pray, Father, for my family. I pray for every, fa every family listening and those who will listen, that you would help us, Lord, to come up to the standard, that you would help us, Lord, to overcome our sins, the feelings, the, 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 the temptations, anything that is binding us. Father, I pray that your power would subdue and cut those tendrils, cut those things, those cords that bind us. Father, help us do a work in our life. Help us to be faithful. Help us to come up to, the, come up to snuff, come up to the standard under the fullness of the measure of the stature of Christ. May we have that experience that we might be Rep that we might be able to be recommended to be part of those that will escape, that will remain, and those that will be left. When the overflowing scourge comes to the land, when Christ is about to pour out his fury, may we be able to be numbered as 140 and 4,000, having the experience of Noah and of Daniel and of Job. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.